Um, and today's Bible reading is from Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to 40. Um, if you don't have a Bible or a paper Bible and you would like one, there are some up the back um, at the book stand. So, yes. Um, before we begin, let me pray. Dear gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word um, and the privilege we have to gather around it and around, yeah, discussing how you've saved us, Lord, um, today as your people. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, teach us from your word and feed us, Lord, today. Um, yeah, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed, so there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John for them, to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying of the apostles on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he set, started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who was the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Is that 
Well, there's no need to hide this fact about Christians. Christians want to see more people become Christians. We, we want to see more people know Jesus because we think there's nothing better than to know God and to be known by God. We want to see more come in to the kingdom, know the joy and eternal life that we have. It's natural. If we believe that this is the good news, then how else should we respond? So we want to see our friends. We want to see our family members. We want to see everyone around us know Jesus Christ. We want to see people saved, but sometimes it just seems so hard. There just seems to be so many barriers for, to people actually coming to trust Jesus. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems almost impossible to break through these obstacles. And we're thinking, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe, maybe I'm missing a secret ingredient. Maybe there's something that you know, I just need for, to break through. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. May, maybe it's, it's a philosophy, worldview sort of training that we need, that we need we need to be able to critically engage with the culture more and the prevailing worldviews to sort of uh, deconstruct those and engage with those on this higher academic level. Um, maybe, maybe it's apologetics. Um, maybe we need better archaeological uh, evidence. Maybe we need uh, more studies on the historicity of the Bible. Maybe it's uh, engaging with questions like, um, where is God when there's so much evil in the world? Or maybe you think this. You think, if I could only... If I could only do miracles, if I could do signs and wonders, man, if I could heal that person, if I could make this amazing thing happen, if I could show power, then my friends, they would believe. Surely they would. They couldn't deny it then. And maybe you're not a Christian and you're here with us today. It's so wonderful you're here with us. And you're thinking, yeah, if I saw some of these things or if I had some of these things, that might be the thing that helps me to trust in Jesus. That would actually help. So what is the key ingredient? Well, friends, today, as we conclude our last sermon in this Acts series, we're going to see that it's something much, much more simple, but something infinitely more powerful than any of those things, and something that we need to be reminded of each and every day. Well, let me give you a bit of a context of where we've been in the book of Acts. Last week, we saw the story of Stephen, one of God's people. Uh, He was killed for his faith. Uh, the first martyr of the church. And this is the start of a severe persecution of the church. Men, women, and children, even children, are being dragged off and put into prison right now because of the persecution happening to the church. But God is still in control. The gospel can't be stopped. It's still spreading. And today we see the story of Philip, one of the godly men appointed to help the practical needs of the church uh, back in Acts chapter 6. Um, But we see that he's also a preacher of the gospel as well, which also shows that the gospel is at the heart of everyone in this early church. Let's see how God uses him. And we're at our first point. It's the faith of a sorcerer. This is the mission statement for the book of Acts, just to give you a reminder. Uh, This is where the gospel is going. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, just like we sang in our first song. We're seeing the spread of the gospel. So friends, come with me to Acts chapter chapter 8, verse 4. Have a look with me in your Bibles. Uh, Please follow along in your Bibles with me. It's important that we keep looking at God's Word. Okay, if you don't have a Bible, maybe someone next to you will share with you. Yep. Acts 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the Word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Wonderful. Yep. Now, the church is being scattered, yeah, it's being persecuted, but through this evil, what's God actually doing? He's actually making His plan happening. We can see that up here, right? The church is being scattered, um, but as they're going, wherever they're going into hiding, they're also preaching the Word. And Acts 1 verse 8 is being fulfilled. What Jesus said right at the start would happen. Um, This is really significant. Uh, Here's a little bit of a map of Philip's journeys. Um, We see here that he goes down to Samaria. They think it was a city called Sebast, which was sort of like the capital sort of area there. Uh, So from Jerusalem to Samaria. Who were the Samaritans? Uh, They were actually people of mixed ancestry, of Jewish and Gentile blood, which meant that they were actually despised by both sides. Uh, They were seen as, uh, because they weren't pure blood Jews, they were despised, they were seen as dogs, they were unfaithful, they were mixed half-breeds who believed in God, but they also had their own system of worship. They said, oh, we worship here, 
you guys worship in Jerusalem, that's wrong, we worship here, this is the true place of worship. And the setting of this story is significant, isn't it? Because it's showing us salvation is going to places that it has never gone before. The gospel is spreading, even to these half-Jewish unfaithful people. And I love how clear Philip's purpose is in verse 5. Um, do you see what it says in verse 5? Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah. That's why he's there, to proclaim the Messiah, to say Jesus the King is here. And, but he didn't just speak, he performed amazing signs. He's there and he cast out demons. He's healing the lame and the sick. You know, he's, he's, he's uh, helping people walk. He's continuing to perform the powerful acts that Jesus started and the apostles kept going. And note in verse 6 what it says. It says that they are called signs. Signs. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Um, I think Isaac Cowling told us about this in a previous sermon, but what's the point of a sign? Kids, this is something even you, you know. What's the point of a sign? If you go to McDonald's and you see the sign, the McDonald's sign, what's the point of that sign? It's to tell you to come inside and eat cheeseburgers, okay? It would make no sense whatsoever if you went to McDonald's and you just looked at the sign and said, this is wonderful, and then just went home. You're missing something. You would be very sad. I know, kids, you would be very sad if, if Dad took you to do that. I might do it as a joke, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit mean, isn't it? I won't do that. McDonald's is a treat, yeah. So the signs point to something, and we need to remember, that's a key point for this sermon, to remember, the signs point to something. Signs are not the end in and of themselves. And these signs that Philip are doing are pointing to the fact that Jesus is defeating sin. As he casts out demons, as Philip heals people, he's continuing the work of Jesus, he's rolling back the impact of sin, he's showing Jesus is king. But Philip isn't actually the only one doing amazing things in the city. There's a character called Simon the Sorcerer. What a wonderful name, Simon the Sorcerer. Well, that's what I'm calling him anyway. Acts 8, verse 9. Have a look. Acts 8, verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Now, the narrative, it sets up a showdown, right? Yeah, on one side is Simon the sorcerer, and on the other side is Philip. It doesn't tell us exactly what he did, but it, sh it tells us that everyone was amazed, right? Uh, it tells us that he practiced magic, um, and I'm assuming this is more than just um, some card tricks in a back alley. Uh, it says people were amazed, all the people of Samaria were, and they paid him attention, even the top-ranking officials. This was someone powerful. They said in verse 10, this man is rightly called the great power of God. In verse 11, they followed him because of his sorcery. They thought Simon was a messenger from God, a powerful messenger. And it seemed that Simon loved that. This guy loved it. The end of verse 9 says this, he boasted he was someone great. He boasted he was someone great. No humility here. Look at me. I can do magic. <laughs> I want to point out something quickly um, about this. Both back then and now today, there are spiritual forces that exist. There are spiritual forces that are bigger than what we can see and touch with our hands. This is going against our materialistic worldview, which says it's only what you can see around you and touch that's real. No, there's a spiritual realm out there, friends. We need to know this. And there is evil spiritual power that can be tapped into. Missionaries in remote places will tell you stories of witchcraft, shamanism, evil spirits. So we need to know, just because someone can do miraculous things, it doesn't mean they are from God. Beware. This is a warning. There's something for us to know. So what happens when a rival power comes to town? What happens? Have a look at verse 12 with me. <clears throat> but when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. 
But people believed and were baptized. And note this, how this happened. Verse 12, what does it say? As Philip proclaimed what? Magic? No, as Philip proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. People saw the signs. They were in awe of these signs, powerful signs. But through the signs, Simon pointed them somewhere, or he pointed them to someone, Jesus Christ. Towards Jesus, the good news that the king, that he is king, and he's inviting all to come into the kingdom. And in verse 13, we see that even Simon the sorcerer believed and was baptized. Good news, right? Well, the scriptures actually hint at something. They hint something's not quite right with Simon. It describes Simon like this. Have a look at verse 13. It says this, He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by his great signs and miracles he saw. We see Simon following Philip like a fan. Um, All right, I'm going to do a little survey here. Who here is a Justin Bieber fan? Hands up. Who here is a Justin Bieber fan? Yep, good, some proud ones. Audrey, come on, put your hand up. Come on. No judgment, only love, guys. Um, I remember a, a while back, uh, I saw this video of Justin Bieber, and I don't often feel sorry for celebrity superstars, but I felt sorry for him in this case because he was just trying to have a nice little lunch uh, in this little cafe, and a horde of teenage girls came out of nowhere and came running. I think I saw some of you girls in, I'm just kidding. So, um, they came running, and they were chasing Justin Bieber down the street, and he, this guy literally, like, you don't normally see celebrities, like, flustered, and, like, you know, they normally have body, like, he just went sprinting down the road, like, he was just running away, he couldn't get away from these people, they were following him everywhere, they worshipped him, I felt quite sorry for the guy, and this is the picture I have of what Philip is like, right here, um, or what Simon, sorry, is doing to Philip, he's a fanboy, he's an awe- awestruck fan, he's and why? Did you see what it says? He followed Philip everywhere, not because of the gospel, but because he was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. He was just following Philip because he saw power, he saw miracles, and he was a fan. This hints here that Philip, although on the surface seeming to have believed, may have missed a point. He's seen the signs, but he hasn't actually seen the one the signs are pointing to. And we see this idea develop as the text goes on. Have a look at verse 14 with me in your Bibles. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a bit of an unusual situation, um, because isn't the Holy Spirit supposed to come as soon as someone's saved? Isn't that what it says? The Apostle Peter says so himself in Acts 2, says this, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's going on here? Why why this two-stage belief, and now the Apostles have to come and lay on their hands? Friends, we must remember what's going on here. Salvation is coming to Samaria. These are non-Jews being saved. This is special, which means a special working of the Spirit. That's why the apostles had to be sent all the way from Jerusalem. You know, you had to get the the head of the church, the leaders to come to confirm the conversion of the Samaritans with their own eyes. That's why they had to place their hands on them so that there could be no doubt that these people now have the same Spirit as all the other believers around. This was a special working of the Spirit. This is especially important because Samaritans, for them to be saved, this was so controversial. I don't think we can really grasp it. Um, maybe it's, it's like us bringing Nazis into the church, you know, or something. That's how hated they were. And then all of a sudden they're saved. This, this is something very controversial. They were seen as dogs, but now they can be God's people. This is confirming that. This is not the norm today. Uh, Because this was something very special that was happening right there. This was a special working. The gospel is breaking new ground, which means a special working of the Spirit, just like at Pentecost in Acts 2. And Simon the sorcerer, he sees this laying on of the hands, he sees this um, Holy Spirit being given out, and he says to the apostles, hey, can I do that too? 
Can I, can I have some of that power? I would love to be able to give people the Holy Spirit. Acts 8.20 is Peter's reply. Have a look at verse 20. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that He might forgive you for having such thoughts in your heart, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So Simon, I think that's a no from Peter. And here we see Simon's belief exposed. Just like Peter was able to see the heart of Ananias and Sapphira and what they actually were thinking, he can see Simon's heart. It's full of wickedness. Uh, Verse 23 states that uh, it's full of bitterness and captive to sin. Uh, It's hard to know exactly what was going on, but uh, I think his desires, his selfish desires show this. It shows that um, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of gold money. There was some sort of dishonest gain sort of going on, some greed that was in Simon's heart. Simon was probably a really rich guy. It's not hard to imagine being rich when you had magic powers that you could use, right, for your own advantage. And here he wants the gift of God, not for God's glory, but for his own glory. I get this picture of um, Simon the sorcerer in, in like a back alley with like a trench coat on, and he's like, people are coming out of the church, he goes, hey man, you want some Holy Spirit? You know, I can, got some Holy Spirit here, I can give that to you, just a cheap price, come on. <laughs> he, he just wants it for this honest gain. And that's a tragic response to the saving news of the gospel, an absolute tragedy. He was so close, yet so far. He saw the signs, yet he didn't see the one the signs were pointing to. His fellow townspeople, the other Samaritans, believed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it said in verse 4. They believed the name of Jesus Christ. But Simon was captured by powerful signs and missed the one they were pointing to. He wanted the gift, but he ignored the giver. And as we leave this story, we're not sure what, where he stands with God. In verse 24, he says this to Peter, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. He doesn't actually obey what Peter says. Peter says, repent and pray to God. He says, hey, Peter, how about you pray for me instead? It's a bit of an odd response. I'm not sure where he's at. We're left wondering. But here's a warning for us. Don't be so caught up in the signs that you forget the ones that the signs are pointing to. Don't be so caught up in the signs that you've missed the ones the signs are pointing to. Maybe for your faith journey, um, this has been, maybe for your faith journey, this has been, um, like God has done something miraculous in your life, okay? So you're here today and some, God's something, something miraculous in your life. Maybe, maybe he's healed a cancer. Maybe he's rescued you from debt. You were in big trouble. Maybe, maybe he's brought you your dream spouse. And you praise God. And you say that a huge part of your testimony is how good God is. Look how kind God is to me. He's done these things for me. And yes, amen. God is good. But if that is all your testimony is, then there's something missing. You're seeing the sign, but you aren't seeing the one the sign's pointing to because Jesus is missing. And I've heard testimonies like this where it's about God's goodness and providing me something, giving me something, helping me with something, but no Jesus. No Jesus. Or maybe you're attracted to the faith because of the message of blessing, that, that being a Christian means eternal security, joy, freedom, fulfillment, satisfaction. Yes, amen, yes. But if Jesus is missing, then you've come for the gifts and not the giver. Both of these things were heart issues for Simon the sorcerer. Are they heart issues for you? Friends, Don't just look at the sign. Signs that don't point to the ultimate destination are useless. Gifts that don't result in glory to the giver are useless. They won't save you. They won't. Because they don't bring about real faith. Well, what does? The next part of the story gives the contrast. It paints a simple but powerful picture of real faith. And this is our second point, the faith of a eunuch. Uh, Acts 8, verse 26. Have a read with me. Acts 8, verse 26. 
Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to, to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kendake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And we're back to our map and we see uh, where Simon is now. He's gone down to Gaza, this road. Um, Ethiopia is down south. And God sends Philip to a specific place at a specific time because he's got a specific salvation plan in store here. I love how nothing happens by accident under God. Yeah, it's all under his control. And Philip meets an Ethiopian eunuch. And before we go any further, a few things to note about this. Who was this guy? Well, he was an important official, all right, in charge of the whole treasury of the queen. This was not just some small fry. This is an important guy. And who was he? He was a God-fearing Gentile. We know that because he's actually on his way back from the temple in Jerusalem. So this is an Ethiopian guy who has gone to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. He's on his way back here. Um, God-fearers, that's a, sort of the broad category, were Gentiles that adopted Jewish religious practices. They were converts to Judaism, yeah? So this was sort of like a Jewish Gentile, yeah? And another thing to note was he was a eunuch. Eunuchs were servants who were castrated, so that they couldn't have sexual relations with female servants or slaves. Uh, why is this point in here? This is actually significant, because there was actually Old Testament laws in Deuteronomy that uh, uh, meant eunuchs w- couldn't actually enter the temple courts. They couldn't actually uh, worship fully. So even though this man wanted to worship God, he had to do it at a distance. What an interesting character this guy is. A sort of Jewish Gentile reading scriptures as well, but he's a eunuch, so he's limited in his worship. Can this man be saved? Well, the Spirit leads Philip to walk beside the chariot, and Philip um, asks this eunuch, uh, he says, hey, do you, you're reading scriptures. Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch looks down on him and replies, how can I, unless someone helps me to understand this? So he reaches out his hand, he invites, he invites Philip up into the chariot with him, and they start doing a one-to-one together right? If you've ever done a one-to-one with someone else, you're part of something historic, guys. They read a scripture together from uh, Isaiah 53 about God's servant. Have a look at verse 32 with me. This is a quote from Isaiah 53. He was led like a lamb, like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth." The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet to- the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Here is a passage speaking of God's servant, right? This Isaiah 53, speaking of the servant of God, his servant, God's servant, who would be led like a lamb, to the slaughter. His servant that would not speak back to those who insulted him, but would stay silent. His servant who would be humiliated. His servant who would be deprived of justice. That's what it says in verse 33. Given an unfair trial and condemned falsely. His servant who would have his life taken from him. And as Philip sits down with the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, this is talking about the Messiah. This is talking about the one you've been waiting for, the Jewish um, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This is about his innocent death on a cross by wicked men. This is all about Jesus. This is about him being the sacrificial lamb that dies in our place. And Philip, he proclaims the gospel. He just speaks about Jesus. I love this. If you ever open up the Old Testament, I bet you you've had a moment where you said, what on earth is this about, all right? What is going on here? And here's the answer. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus himself declares this as he speaks to his disciples um, in Luke 24, verse 44. After his resurrection, this is what Jesus says. Look, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me 
and the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Jesus is saying every bit of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, it's all about me. Did you realize that? Did you realize that, friends? The Old Testament scriptures are a giant sign saying, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. This is how Jesus puts it in John 5 as he rebukes the Pharisees, the religious teachers. He rebukes them. He says this, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And when he talks about scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament because there was no New Testament back then. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying this, if you want to find eternal life in the Scriptures, that's what the Pharisees were trying to find, Jesus is saying, you can find it. You just have to see that they are all pointing to me. To me. And this is the eternal life that the Ethiopian eunuch finds on that day. It's a beautiful, simple picture of discipleship leading to real, real faith. What happens? Um, he opens up the Scriptures, he reads it, um, a Christian comes beside him to read it with him, to help him understand what's going on here. He's pointed towards Jesus. He sees Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises. And then he believes and is baptized right then and there. That's it. What do we need to be saved? What is the secret ingredient that will bring people to faith? This is it. This is all you need. All you need is God's Word pointing to Jesus Christ. That's it. Friends, there's some implications for us here. Two implications that I'll cover quickly. Number one is this, don't leave Jesus out. Ever heard the saying, um, preach the gospel, but sometimes with words? Something along those lines. It's the, the sentiment is this, that, you know... Um, Part of what we do as Christians, you know, as we preach the gospel is we're good people in this world, we're kind, uh, we're lovely, we're supposed to embody love and forgiveness and grace, um, and that's a positive witness. And this is absolutely necessary. We need to do it to commend the gospel, but if you are simply a nice person and you don't speak the gospel, there can be no real faith. Because the gospel, what does it mean? It means good news, and good news takes words. Gospel friendships, uh, that's what we've been doing in our group, in our groups, right? Um, if you just care for someone, if you connect with them, if you have friendships with them, wonderful. You've got to do that. But if you never get to communicate Christ, let me tell you something, they won't be saved. They can't be saved. Because this is how God has chosen to work. His God-ordained means of working in this world is His words. He could have chosen anything. He could have said, Give this person a donut, they'll be saved, whatever. <laughs> he's, but he's chosen words because he's a God of words. His word recorded in the Bible, pointing towards Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who has lived and died and risen again for the forgiveness of sins. This is how people are saved. These words bring about real faith. They bring people from death to life. They bring salvation. So friends, don't leave your friends staring at the sign. Make sure they see the one the sign's pointing to. And the second implication is this, be comforted. Friends, isn't it great that you don't need a theology degree or a philosophy degree or any other sort of degree to help your friends know Jesus? Isn't, it, isn't that a wonderful thing? That's a huge comfort. Isn't it great we don't need to know all the apologetics or church history or archaeology before people can have eternal life? Isn't it great we don't need to be able to heal a blind person or cast out demons before someone believes in our message? Let me tell you something. One of the greatest comforts that I have as a pastor is that it's not up to me to save people, but it's God's Word doing the work. Because if it was up to me, we'd all be in big trouble right now, friends. If it was up to our slick programs and eloquent preaching and all these things to transform hearts, we'd all be in big trouble. But it's God's Word that changes hearts. That's why the authority of God's Word, that's our number one value here. Everything starts here. Preaching, teaching, studying God's Word. We treasure the Word. Without God's Word, there's no point. Because this is how He's chosen to save His people. This isn't how... This, maybe we wouldn't have done it like this, but this is how God has chosen to save His people. So let's take comfort in that. This is His power. 
Ever since the early church, this has been going on. Think about it. People opening up God's Word together, reading God's Word together, and people being saved. This has been going on since the church began. This is the bread and butter of discipleship. And if you are part of this simple act of reading the Bible with someone, you are part of something historic and powerful because souls are being saved and people are grown when people open up God's Word. And I'd argue, although this is simple, this is real power, real power, bigger than any miraculous healing, bigger than any demon being cast out, bigger than any sign or wonder. This is a miracle. When we open up God's Word and we see Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and people repent and believe, this is a miracle. Because this is people being saved for eternity. What a precious gift we have in God's Word. So precious. My fear is that we take it for granted so often. I know I do. What a precious gift we have. If you aren't a Christian yet, and you're here with us, I'd encourage you, open up the Bible. Read and see who Jesus is. There's three Bibles up the back on that bookshelf there. Pick up one of those, take it home, start reading the book of Mark, I'd encourage you. It's a gospel, Jesus' story. See Jesus, ask a Christian friend to help you. That's going to be your step in your journey. And for the Christians here, who, who can you invite to read the Bible with you? Who can you sit down with and just open up the Scriptures with and just read, talk, have a discussion? At Christmas, we'll be giving out actually a free uh, gospel book called The Essential Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus Christ. Um, Invite your friends to come to Christmas and then offer to read with them as we give them this gift. Who can you read the Bible with? This could be the first step to real faith. Real faith. Now, friends, it seems we're just getting started on the book of Acts, right? In one sense, it's just getting good. The church is exploding. The gospel is going out. Uh, We've just met this character, Saul, uh, who is persecuting the church but God's going to actually use this guy to grow his church very soon. But we're finishing our series today. We'll pick it up again next year. I encourage you to keep reading Acts over the holidays if you want to know more. But I hope today has reminded you again of our big theme, that the gospel is unstoppable. The gospel is unstoppable. To this day, God is powerfully working through his word to save people. Isn't that the case? We're reading about this ancient history, but it's happening right now. It's happening. Look around you. The people in this room is living proof that's the case, that the gospel is powerful and the gospel saves. So as I leave you today, as we conclude this series, I want you to take comfort in this, friends. Take comfort in it. Go out. Boldly proclaim the gospel. Open up the Bible with people. Read it with them and be confident, not, not because you are great, but because God is great. And he works through his word powerfully to save people. Real faith happens when people open God's word and they see Jesus Christ, friends. Let's take comfort in this. Let me pray. Father God, we ask that you help us to never move from this unshakable foundational truth that you work to save people through your word. Help us never to get caught up in the latest fads or things that we think are needed, but let us keep coming back to the gospel, to keep preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, to keep opening your word up and to really trust and have faith that this is the way that people will be saved. And we pray that you will save many through us opening up the Bible with our friends, all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.